On this week's episode of the A to B podcast, I'm joined by Ashling Noonan, having graduated in 2015 from Cork Institute of Technology with a bachelor's degree in marketing. Ashling went on to study a master's in marketing practice. Having worked with Musgrave for two years, Ashling made the move to the Big Apple in 2017, where she is currently a business development and marketing associate for Siegel and Gale, a global brand strategy, design, and experience firm. Hi, Ashling. Hi, Jack. How are you? Thank you so much for having me on today. No worries at all. Um, I, I think we connected on LinkedIn about, uh, geez, must have been about a year ago at this point, and um, I saw a lot of the work that uh, you were doing over with Siegel and Gale, and I was like, God, I'd love to have a chat with this girl now and see what the crack is. So, um, a no brainer, I'd have you on. I must actually ask though, is it Siegel and Gale or Siegel plus Gale? It's Siegel and Gale. Yeah, with the, the plus it, sign in the middle. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Jim plus coffee have that thing where, where they're called Jim plus coffee and then some people say Jim and coffee. And whenever oh, I hear it, okay. I'm like, it's not Jim and coffee, it's Jim plus coffee. So I wasn't too sure if it was the same with Siegel and Gale. Yeah, Siegel and Gale. And just to note, this is actually my first time doing a podcast. So there's a first time for everything and all that. Um, but I was thinking, I was like, I'm fond of sending a few voice notes. So I was thinking it's kind of the same thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's fair. Uh, I've got a friend and you, you'll text him being like, where are you? I'm, I'm outside or whatever. And he will send a one second voice recording to be like, I'm just on the way out. But uh, yeah, no voice recordings are a handy way. Actually, <laughs> interesting enough, the um, the voice tweets or the audio tweets and Twitter, I don't think uh, they lived to see the day, did they? Yeah, I didn't really see too much about them. Although I did see um, separately on LinkedIn, they do have the feature now where you can actually record how to pronounce your name. I saw that. Which to me, being in the US, is really handy because I get easling a lot what? of the time. So. No way. So that was a nice feature. That's brilliant. Yeah, easling. <laughs> so I was always expecting someone was going to do something smart with that pronunciation feature. And the first person I saw, uh, or I've seen online do something brilliantly with it, is Stephen Ryan, where he goes... He says, you know, Stephen Ryan, I'm also available on Twitter. He says he's at and he says, I'm also on Instagram and he gives his thing. So it goes on for more than just the, I suppose, one second you'd need to say your name. But he gets everything in there. That's clever. Extremely clever. But I guess like it wouldn't be like Stephen not to be ahead of the game when it comes to uh, all things digital. Um, but Ashling, I'd like to take you back to, uh, I suppose, before college, you know, you're leaving cert days and, and why you why you picked marketing in CIT. Um, what led you to uh, that uh, decision? Of course. So I guess looking back now, kind of at the, the young age of 18, when you're in school and you're trying to figure out what it is you want to do, I had so many, like I didn't want to go down the doctor route or the teacher route. And I was like, what else will I do? Um, so I had a couple of different things on the CAO. I had interior architecture. I had um, an event marketing course over in London. But my career uh, career coach in school had advised me against London because it was a lonely city. Um, so I don't thank him for that. But anyway, that's a story for another day. Um, but business studies, I figured it was really, really broad. So I actually started off in the business studies route. It was a three-year level seven degree. Oh, you did a level seven. Wow. I did, yeah. And basically it was because I was like, you know what, if I don't like it, I can do the three years and I can go off into something else. And what I did love about business studies was you kind of had the opportunity to study marketing, management and accounting at once. So you kind of get like a little mini feel for each one. And I think um being in the marketing stream I really really enjoyed kind of the strategic marketing elements I enjoyed the consumer behavior modules and everything kind of along that track along with the creative aspect and the presentations and the live assignments that we had to do so I actually went on then and I I did the branched into the level eight marketing so I did end up doing four years in that um, and had a really really great time that I actually went back for more and did the marketing practice masters also in CIT. I know yeah no you you spent a good uh, five years there in total um, but it's, it's interesting that you did the level seven I wasn't aware of that because um, I, I'm like very passionate about the course and I, I love the fact that I picked marketing but it is an actual regret I wish I had done the level seven instead because there are often times where I'm going you know I'm doing something I'm a marketing project or you know doing market research or whatever and I just kind of think to myself I wish I saw the bigger picture I wish I understood the business side of things I wish I understood like kind of the I suppose accounting to a degree I wish I kind of because like I've studied marketing straight on for the last four years. Um, and then when, you know, I listened to another podcast about business, 
I'm like, that is also extremely interesting. And I'm like, I, maybe I should have went for the level seven. Um, would you would you say that the level seven would be a good way to go for, we'll say, maybe leaving certs or for people who are thinking of going back to college, but just have a general interest in business? Yeah, completely. I think personally, when you're just uncertain, like business in general as a whole is such an important degree to have, because even if you branch in to entrepreneurship or something else, you always kind of have that to fall back on. And I do I do find just given, as I mentioned, having the the exposure to the management, accounting and marketing streams, you're you're kind of getting insight into all of them. And that's in first year. And you kind of realize, okay, what you're good at, what you're not so good at. For me, it was definitely the economics track I wasn't really the best at um, and things like that. Um, but I definitely would recommend business studies as a degree as a whole. And I actually met um, a former lecturer recently and he spoke about the popularity of the course. I think, I don't know exactly the numbers off the top of my head, but I know for us, I think there was a hundred and odd people in the year, but now there's up to like 800 in that faculty, um, which is insane. But I guess it's it's a good sign. I mean, more and more people have an interest in kind of business and maybe marketing as a whole. Um, so it is great and I, I definitely would recommend it yeah no, I, I think so I, I think the likes of um, especially social media I think young people are beginning to I suppose they're beginning to learn more about brands I don't think they know it's branding just yet but they definitely have an appreciation for I suppose influencers or ambassadors um, and you know I think it depends it, it's up to the college then to kind of send that signal or you know to send that message across and be like this is actually marketing what you've been looking at, you know, like you, you might jump on, you might set 20 minutes in the evening aside to go and look at a certain influencer's Instagram story. That's marketing. Absolutely. And it's funny that you say that. Um, only yesterday we hosted an event with my current company that I'm working with now and it was CMOs and their Gen Z kids. So it was insights from the Gen Z population and oh my God, blown away by the knowledge that these kids have as it pertains to marketing. And one guy actually at the end, he is the CMO of Snapchat, spoke about how he was so impressed how these Gen Z teenagers, they were aged from 13 to 20, um, how they know so much about brands and marketing as a whole. And one kid gave feedback that kids nowadays, don't just care about your product they actually care about your brand purpose and the causes that you support and that they actually go out of their way to like research your brand and I just find that so interesting there's kind of brands can't really escape the Gen Z and I think they are like back in when I first started marketing it wasn't really as big of a thing as it is now and I think it's so interesting and I think just for the industry as a whole um with the gen z getting behind it it's it's just evolving um and i think that's a great thing for for marketing in cit especially and hopefully the popularity of it because as well with marketing i guess it's constantly evolving like digital marketing wasn't really a big focus when i was in college whereas now it's massive and there's digital marketing specific courses out there now um whereas when i first started back in 2015 there wasn't as much of a focus on the digital element as there is today so it's, it's so interesting i think that's very true and I, I think it's definitely represented in the fact that we now have the cork digital marketing awards um and today for when the uh this this uh, recording was done a lot of the nominations went up um and it's always it, it's kind of for me when i was younger we'd look at the rose of tralee the carries i'd come out and we'd go into the paper and we'd look at who all the roses were um we get a buyer and we'd mark who was going to win and now I'm doing that with the uh, digital uh, marketing awards and I'm looking through all the different businesses. I'm looking like, you know, like less than 20 employees or more or whatever it is. I'm like, oh, that one. Oh, I know that one. I've seen those guys. So I think uh, that digital marketing and even that community in Cork, I think is huge. Why did you decide to study the postgrad in marketing practice? So for me, the postgrad in marketing practice, mainly because I didn't have any current marketing experience in the in the industry. So I figured the marketing practice actually offered that. And it was a one year master's degree. And I, I figured it was such a competitive market that I needed something to give me that bit of an advantage. So I opted to do the master's. It was a small group of like 21 people, some of the same lectures as we had in the undergrad. And what I really, really liked about the course was that there was a lot of live assignments. Um, 
We worked with companies like Monster Rugby, Cork GAA, the Blue Haven Cafe in Kinsale and Cork Harbour Boat Hire and along with many other companies as well. Um, but mainly the main focus of doing the Masters was to actually get my foot in the door and get that industry experience through the workplace element of the course. And when you say you got your foot in the door, I'd say you got it in fairly well. Um, and that's a fairly nice transition from me. But you got into Musgraves. Yeah, so I was really, really lucky and, and grateful to get my internship with Musgrave. I know starting off in the Masters that they had actually took somebody from that course each year. And I think it was kind of a competitive one. Obviously, Musgrave here in Cork is a, a pretty well-known company. And I I think there was like 13 of us or so went for the interview. And I was really grateful to have gotten chosen for the job. Um, so it was actually a 12-month work placement, which was really, really great, considering that placement with the Masters was only for six months. Um, so I had six additional months of employment there. So I started off on the local brand marketing team for the Super Value brand. Mm. And to me, when I initially had thought of Musgraves, I think of, you know, you see the super value in the centre and you see the Musgrave wholesale unit up on Ballycarine. Um, I didn't really know exactly what they did until I actually researched the brand. So when I started off on the local brand marketing team, I was the intern and I worked closely with the local brand manager. And that involved us locally on an individual level like managing the marketing materials for each individual super value store um, across the country so that at the time I think there was about 222 in total um, so I would have worked closely on various sponsorships local radio advertisements local newspaper adverts um, store revamps store openings kind of local in-store wine tasting events and everything kind of along the lines of that so it was really, really great exposure into the consumer goods industry. And I got a feel for for, for that that food business and being part of, of kind of a local team and supporting each local retailer. And um, so really, really enjoyed my time there as the local local marketing student intern. When it comes to the store revamps, that would have been kind of 2015, 2016 area, right? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. what, what, what exactly happened there? Because... If I can recall correctly, I'm almost certain I remember those those doors being revamped, which is kind of weird that you would have been behind that and I'm now talking to you. Because in 2015, 2016, I, I think I was only in third year or fifth year of secondary school. But I do remember that the kind of the whites and the stainless steels and cold colors, it was kind of dull colors, they went out and a lot more kind of natural colors came in. We got, It was a lot more greens and you know red came in. And the only one thing I can remember is a lot of wood. There was a lot of a lot of timber was put everywhere. The off licenses were, were stocked with all wooden pallets and kind of wooden shelves and stuff. It was no longer put up against kind of those kind of metal shelves and things. Would that would that have been it? Yeah, so there was there was actually a specific um kind of a store revamp team specifically, but I guess my role on the local end would be supplying the various point of sale for each store and, and kind of doing the ordering of the products and then having kind of a launch party um, and an event for customers to actually come in. But in terms of what you're saying about the store revamps completely, you could see the rollout kind of gradually stores would actually see other stores getting behind it and incorporating this new look and feel into the brand. And as you mentioned, the wood, it was definitely kind of that rustic sort of look and feel that they were going for um and so yeah work worked closely with the the store development team um on kitting out the new stores making sure they had everything for launch um and creating that event that the local community and customers would be involved in and invited in to actually see the new store and experience experience the new look and feel that's that's really interesting, uh, especially for Super Value because they have a, a huge kind of emphasis on their local community. Absolutely, they're, they're the heart and soul of the community. Even the Centre brand now as well. You're just seeing, especially over the, over the last couple of months, you're seeing them pull together and embracing that community spirit more so now than ever before, which is really really great to see. So after your masters in the marketing practice, Ashling, um, you finished up the local marketing intern with Super Value, and you were promoted to assistant brand manager. Yeah, correct. So I was lucky enough to get promoted to the assistant brand manager after my twelve month stint as the local intern, and this role was actually more so on the national level. 
So myself, along with um, fellow assistant brand managers on the team, were on the value for money team. So my role now was to actually create the handbill. So the national leaflet that you get with all the offers in the door. Some people no might use it as firewood. Others might actually read it. Um, we It was my job, along with my, my colleagues, to actually have that printed every three weeks. So it would be from start to end working with the trading team, the sales team to figure out what offers would actually be placed in the leaflet every three weeks and would work with the trading team to make sure we've signed off on every product. Um, every third Friday would be handbill Friday, we'd call it. So you'd be proofing for the whole day. So you'd be going back and forth with the calculator, making sure you have the price is correct. Obviously, a really important thing in the grocery industry. Um price per weight, price per kilo, um, and everything along those lines. Um, so so I guess maths and school really came in handy there. Um, but yeah, like it was it was great kind of seeing that finished product and the excitement then once the handbill was printed and it would come into into the office, you'd be kind of looking out, um, making sure you don't spot any mistakes that you didn't spot on that handbill Friday. Um, so that was loved, loved everything about that. As stressful as it might have been on the Friday, it was it was really, really great to work on something from start to finish and work with the design team on the look and feel and everything like that. Um, and I guess along with this, um, I actually would have worked on local or sorry, national um, press advertisements. So offers that you'd see on kind of the Sun newspaper, the Star newspaper for the Super Value brand, along with TV advertisements and also national radio advertisements. And I loved the excitement when you're kind of sitting in traffic and you turn on the radio and on comes the super value ad and it's like, oh, there's our work. Um, so that it, it's nice to always see something tangible at the end of the day. Um, so really, really enjoyed um, working on that team. And it's funny now being away and now that I'm back, I actually, um, anytime I go into the store, I always pick up the handbill and I take it home with me and I look through it and you're, you're just naturally like look, it's not like I'm looking for errors because I know the team working on it are amazing but you're you're just in that <laughs> mindset of you're not really looking at the products it's like you're looking for typos <laughs> um but but it's funny but I, I do love going Brilliant. into the store still and the in-store experience and and even over in New York it's it's funny one of my friends actually has this um kind of plug-in thing to the tv that give you all the Irish channels and I would never watch any adverts or I barely watched TV, but I remember sitting in her house one day and I think RTE was on and then a super value ad came on in the background in the middle of New York City. And I'm like, oh, we need to leave this on and had to watch the ad from start to end. But there, there's just something about it that you're always just intrigued. I think what the what the brand is kind of doing and what the team behind it are doing. Um, so, yes. So really, really loved working there and working on that team, especially. You were obviously very happy and very content when you were with Super Value, especially in the assistant brand manager role, right? I was, I was until until an itch came along. Um, I had a I had a bit of a tra- an urge for a bit of travel. I mean, like not not everyone gets to go for a bit of travel and end up at one of the world's biggest uh, marketing agencies. How does how does that come about? I mean, how did you get that opportunity? Yeah, so it's all a bit of a roller coaster. I can't even re- I can't remember the day for the life of me that. I decided I'm going to move to New York um, and I actually moved there with two of the girls that I met in the marketing practice masters in CIT um, which was really really great so the three of us decided to to go and I remember telling my boss in Musgrave at the time that I was thinking of going to New York and, and he was kind of shocked like you know but in a way he's supportive of it because he said if he had looked back maybe 10 years 10, 10 years ago he would have done the exact same thing and regrets not doing it and I think being back in Cork you know a company like Musgrave is always going to be there and I figured you know what I need to go out to the big bad world um with my marketing degree behind me and go to kind of the capital of marketing in the world um so I did a one-year graduate visa um to New York and left left on a one-way flight in October of 2017, um, thinking I was going there for just the year. Um, so off we went and no job. So left, left wow. my, my good job in Musgrave, um, had no apartment set up, no nothing. Um, wow. Went over there completely blindsided. But I look back now and I'm like, you know what? It's the best thing I could have ever done. 
It's it's crazy you went out with, without a job over there. Completely. And I kind of did my research before I went, applied for a couple of jobs, but I probably could have done a bit more homework. Um, I kind of left a lot of it until I got over there. And what sure when you land when you land, it's you're automatically looking for accommodation. You're automatically trying to navigate the subway system. I had no idea. I I was in New York, I think, when I was twelve years old and do, did not know the city at all whatsoever and you're just adapting to being away from home for the first time and everything like that and it's all so new and then it kind of hits you that like okay you need to go and get a job um and looking for a job is a full-time job as such so mm. so that was definitely the toughest process of it all um especially being on the one-year graduate visa no company will want to take you in and have and see you go one year later. Um, so that was definitely kind of a downside to the visa. Um, for me, I was really, really lucky to, to meet um, my current boss who kind of took me under her wing and I'm still with the company today, um, which I'll chat about. But getting getting that job and landing on your feet in New York is tough. But there were there was days I was sitting in Starbucks on the laptop applying for jobs and tears would just roll down your eyes because you're like, God, what have I done? Like I've no job. I left my job at home. I'm here. Nobody wants to hire me. The weather was getting cold. And like in New York, it gets cold. That winter I think we saw minus 16 degrees Celsius temperatures that I've never seen before. So it was mad. But what really, really grounded me was the Irish network. And I think when you move so far away from home, relying on the Irish community is just so important. And I think the Irish community actually want to help you. They like individuals put themselves out of their way to actually help you and bring you along, introduce you to somebody that you don't know. Um, and I think that's how I landed my job with Siegel and Gale. Um, it was all through it was all through personal like reaching out to people on LinkedIn, cold outreach. Um, because you do find that when you're applying for jobs and you can do quick apply on LinkedIn or you can fill out a 40 minute long application form, you'll hear nothing and you could be applying for 100 jobs a day and you might get one call back. And it's funny, I look back at my first week in New York and um, you'll enjoy this story. Um, I Week one and people had said, you know, getting a job in New York is tough. But week one, I had an interview. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, people told me this was hard. Like, you know, what were they talking about? And so I went off, went off to the interview. It was some marketing role for an agency. Did my research. It seemed, well, didn't do enough research, but it seemed like a pretty legit company. So went into Midtown Manhattan, you know, living the dream, suited and booted. And I go into this office building and I'm greeted in the waiting room, fill out a form. And they told me that I was meeting the CEO. And I said to myself, God, this, I don't know if this is risky or if this is like amazing or if this is like the thing in New York, but like meeting the CEO. So off I went in anyway, met the CEO of the company, asked me a couple of questions, got chatting. And he said, okay, Aisling, um, if, <laughs> if, if you're successful, we'll call you back um, before 5.30 this evening and we'll ask you to come in the following day for, to shadow one of our team members. So I was waiting and waiting and waiting that day. Next thing, 5 p.m., got a call. Hey, Aisling, come in tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. You can shadow one of our colleagues. Um, wear comfortable shoes. And it was at that moment I was like, why do I need comfortable shoes? So off I went in anyway the next day, not an iota what was going on. So vulner vulnerable, new to the city excited for the opportunity, went into the office building, was greeted by two employees and filled out a kind of a waiver form. And they said to me, Ashling, do you have your, your subway card? And I said, yes. And they were like, okay, let's go. One of them has like a carry on suitcase in their hand. The other has a sandwich board table. And off we go to the subway, bearing in mind I'm there a week and I have no idea, no navigation skills whatsoever of the city. And hop on, I think we connected to three different subways, past the Yankee Stadium up on 161st Street. Didn't know New York had that many streets, but off we went, got off the subway up in the middle of the Bronx, 
with the sandwich board and with the suitcase and they set up shop underneath the train the train track on in the middle of the street so my role that day was to shadow these two gentlemen as they chased people up and down the street trying to get them to sign up for these smartphones and in the back of my head I'm like oh my god here I am with like my my lovely new interview dress on my comfortable shoes and I'm watching these two men run up and down and I did a mar- marketing master's degree for this <laughs> I was like if my mother knew <laughs> that's that's marketing <laughs> exactly. that's how marketing is yeah. in New York it's great so you have to chase, you have to chase the sales, Ashley. Exactly. God, it was mad. So, oh my God. So I remember at one, I think it was around half 12 in the day, one of the, one of the gentlemen turned around and he was like, how are you finding it? And I, I just said, kind of in the nicest way possible, I was like, look, I'm really sorry, but I don't think this is for me. And he was like, but Ashley, like there's so much opportunity at this company. You'd be so silly to walk away from it now, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, look, I'm really sorry. I'm grateful for your time and the experience. And off I went like up to the subway, didn't know if I was going uptown, downtown, like no idea where I was going, but I got back eventually and I lived to tell the tale. And we say to ourselves, it's character building. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something right that's mad I, I I don't know what I would have done myself in that situation I suppose you're you're trying to be Irish you're trying to be nice and and, and not kind of upset them and be like this is yeah. a joke this isn't marketing and what's going on. I don't think I that's what I'm saying I do now but I definitely I would have just stood there and been like I probably would have ran after someone with a phone yeah. too oh it was mad but at least at least it wasn't that cold out that day that's all I'm saying <laughs> that's mad that was one part of your career and, and you left that company. So you became a marketing coordinator then at Siegel and Gale. I did indeed. How does that happen? Like, I mean, how does that conversation come up? I'm I'm baffled. Like, I, I'd love to know. Yeah, of course. It took a lot of hustling, a lot of um, endless coffee, coffee talks with various people in the industry. And I reached out to, to one gentleman on LinkedIn asking for kind of advice and things like that and he actually put me in touch with a lady who is now my boss another Irish lady actually who's been in the US for about 20 years and so I was due to meet this lady for a coffee maybe three weeks after and the week before we were due to meet I went to an Irish consulate first Friday breakfast so this is an, an event that the Irish consulate put on every first Friday or the first Friday of every month should I say And so this woman was actually speaking at the event that day. And while I was there, I was like, okay, I need to go up and introduce myself to her. You know, I'm meeting her for a coffee next week in the, in the Siegel and Gale office. So up I went and introduced myself. We got photographs together and like, we kind of hit it off straight away. It was really, really great. Um, so I, I met, I met up with her the following week in the Siegel and Gale office just for a chat and sent my resume across straight away after she couldn't guarantee me anything straight away um but kind of said she'd do her best to see what she can do and that was that would have been December so I moved in the October so it took two months to get to this point and timing wise December just as people prepare for Christmas and things like that is never really a good time and in the back of my mind I was like okay I'm not going to be employed until January at least the earliest so come January, I am um, my boss, the boss, the current woman actually invited me back in to meet with the marketing director and the head of PR. And I went in and met them in person and had a conversation with them. And in the back of my mind, I was like, I need, I need, I need to work here. You know, they feel so welcoming. Um, there was a nice balance of Irish and, and American people on the team, which was kind of something lovely and homely about it too. Mm. And seemed really great and I got a call saying that they can offer me an intern role and so I said to myself I was I was grateful that I was being offered a position with this with this agency in the city but I was like god I'm not an intern like I came from Musgrave I did the intern thing and then I was an an assistant brand manager I don't really want to go back to being an intern but it's funny what made me actually take that role was I met another lady during my time of kind of networking and reaching out to people when I arrived from Diageo. And one thing she said to me, and it was one bit of advice, she said, don't be afraid to take a step back to actually move forward because she did the exact same thing when she moved to the US. And I think given the nature of the visa and things like that, you have to kind of make those sacrifices. So I took the internship role 
um, and that would have been the beginning of February of 2018 and March 2018 the company had offered me sponsorship for a H-1B visa which was a three-year visa to stay in the U.S. Um, and it was an extension, obviously, to my current one year. So I was really, really grateful for that. Um, and the visa, the visa itself is actually a lottery as well. And I know there's a lot of people that are unlucky in that. So I was really, really grateful to actually be um, selected from the lottery to receive the H-1B visa. Um, so I've been working with Siegel and Gale since, since the beginning of 2018. And so grateful um, for meeting my boss and her kind of taking me under her wing and for everything I've learned from working with the company. Um, so yeah, I mean, things, it was a, it was a rocky start, the whole New York experience, but you have to hustle and you just have to put yourself out there. And I don't think, I think like being, if I had stayed in Ireland, I wouldn't have had built up that muscle of like hustle because I wouldn't have had to, I would have been smooth sailing throughout my career Mm -hmm. and it would have been fine but I think to put myself out of my comfort zone and do something that scared me really really paid off and I just look at myself now and compare it to the person that I was stepping on that plane in 2017 and I think I'm two completely different people um and grateful for for every downfall along the way um just to kind of get me to to where I am today that's um that's wonderful that's uh that's really nice what exactly does a marketing coordinator do? Yeah, of course. So I guess my role at Siegel and Gale, and I think when I was taking the role initially, I wasn't really too sure. I knew agencies worked with clients, but then in this marketing coordinator role, I was told I wasn't working with clients. So I was kind of a bit confused. So going back to the beginning, Siegel and Gale is a global brand strategy design and experience firm, and we're actually owned by the Omnicom Network the second largest holding agency in the world. Um, so we do have a lot of kind of sister agencies and things like that spread across the globe, which is really, really good in that sense. Um, we work with clients such as HPE, SAP, CVS Health, American Express. We did a bit of work for Glombia, which a lot of people in Ireland will relate, um, and the Four Seasons. And Siegel and Gale actually has offices across the globe in London, Dubai, Tokyo, San Francisco, LA, and of course, New York. Wow. And my role as the marketing coordinator was to work within our marketing team. And we have such a large marketing team for an age, a small enough agency of our size. We only have about just over 200 people globally working for the company. And I think we have about 10 people on our team, which is pretty large given in kind of agency terms. So our, our role and being a marketing coordinator, I guess the sole function of marketing is to make the Siegel and Gale brand known and bring clients in, get in front of clients so that they will be a future clients of Siegel and Gale. They'll purchase from us, just kind of getting the name out there. That's kind of the core responsibility of the team. And bringing it back to my day-to-day -day job, it was, it varied from everything from outbound email campaigns, mass email campaigns that we'd send maybe various studies that we would have conducted, sending case studies, et cetera, to clients or prospects prospective clients that we want to get in front of um, along with award submissions so submitting work for our clients just to kind of showcase the work that we would have done for them um, various other things and um, there was a lot of admin admin stuff in the in the coordinator role too um, and I would have worked with um, various other things such as social media campaigns so I would have assisted our PR director on that and supported her also on the blog post, blog posting and the website and content creation and things like that. So I mean, when you put bring it back to everything I learned in marketing, it was kind of a lot of what we would have learned was incorporated into my role as the marketing coordinator. Um, so really, really, really great learnings. Um, and I think having a leader that wants you that wants to develop you and kind of create a path for you to learn and grow was really, really beneficial because she would kind of in involve you in areas of expertise that she thinks you'll benefit from. I think it's important for um, leaders or even managers. It's kind of a thing. You don't work for your manager. Your manager works for you. Your manager is there to develop you 
and to kind of teach you and get you as much experience. Can I ask when it comes to the uh, experience and the, the experience side of what Siegel and uh, Gail do, what exactly does that mean? What, what, what entails when it comes to experience? Brand experience is one of the service offer- offerings that we provide. So it could be anything from website development to creating kind of an in-person live experience. I know we did a lot of work with SAP uh, to launch their Sapphire program. Um, we did various websites for, for various clients along the way. So we do have a specific brand experience focused team uh, within our agency. So it's kind of split up between, I guess, functional roles, such as your marketing, your HR, your finance. And then separately, we have our practice area. So we have a lot of people in, we have a research team, we have a brand strategy team, we have a design team, we have a brand experience team, and we also have a brand communication team. So a lot of a lot of various skills and specialities within within the agency. And it's great to work alongside so many creative people. I didn't even know there was so much to do with a brand there. And I think that really ties back to the start of our conversation about Gen Z, that it's a lot more than just a logo. It's a lot more than just the tagline. It really is that whole experience and everything that kind of ties into that. Can I ask, what's been your most exciting brand or what what brand have you been most fond of? Or are you able to say so? Who have you loved working with the most with your time at Siegel and Gale? Has there been any campaigns that you were just either really happy working on or really just proud with the results? Yeah, so for me, I guess being on the marketing team, I don't actually work directly with clients. But what I do is now in my role as the business development and marketing associate, I actually lead all of our events for the east coast of the US. Wow. Um, so that involves us going to various cities and bringing either our head of research or head of strategy along to an event, have a room of 30 plus CMO level brand side marketing leaders in the room and we'd in a way in kind of a an, an around beating around the bush kind of way set kind of sell and promote our services to them and so for me being in that role as the events lead we've done various events um throughout my time in the role and a couple that stand out to me are international women's day events and pride events that we've done in the past two years and for us we think as an agency relationship building is core to kind of getting in front of clients and prospects and just getting people to kind of know the brand. And those projects to me are not just kind of a project that you work on from start to finish and it's done. International Women's Day, we first started doing, I think maybe six years ago. And last year would have been my first event. And just getting powerful women on stage talking about their kind of experiences but we're actually not only just doing that for the sake of hosting an event it's something that we care about and the same for pride we hosted our first pride event last year so we kind of tie them all around the future of branding so the the pride event was future branding pride edition and so we kind of speak about various companies doing various things as it pertains to pride such as rainbow washing you know is it right is it wrong and I think just working for events that are actually cause related as well as tying in to the core service offering that we provide at Siegel and Gale is something that I really really enjoy working on and just kind of seeing just being there on the day back when we could be there on the day seeing it come to life is just it's just so powerful and we actually hosted um our last in-person event was our 2020 International Women's Day event which I think we hosted on the, the 4th of March in New York in a, in a gorgeous location. Um, and it's just working, working on those events from start to finish. Um, and in, in terms of that, it's kind of working on the recruitment element of it, getting kind of the speakers that we want on stage, getting the, the right guests in the room, working on kind of the look and feel for the leaflets, working on what we'll put in the goodie bags, branded goodie bags and things like that. It's just the whole brand experience. Um, and creating that environment and experience for people where they can come and network and kind of see us at our best um, and I love it's it's just kind of like putting on a show um, but with kind of meaning behind it and that's something that I really enjoy and obviously there had to have been a lot of pivots um, when Covid hit back in, in March but we, we've kind of pivoted we've since hosted 11 CMO events and now we have a global audience opposed to a regional New York audience, which mm. is really super to see. 
Uh, yeah, and even at that, like, I mean, I would assume you're able to reach out to a lot more uh, speakers as well because there's no more having to pay for flights or maybe accommodation in New York. Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of making the most of that. And it's like, who would we like that would normally not be in New York? So yeah, absolutely agree. It's 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 really, really great. It's kind of opened up a lot more opportunities in that sense as well. Yeah, like even recently we hosted an event. It was um another future branding event and it was um kind of about global brand leadership. And we had on the one day, I think we represented five continents in one discussion. Obviously it was probably later in the day for, for some people than others, but it was just so fascinating to see and many people tuning in from all across the world and just being kind of at the core with the team convening that kind of a, an audience is just it's really rewarding in a sense. I'd really like to know more about the uh, Irish International Business Network. Yeah, yeah. So it's the Irish International Business Network. So the IIBN is a global network of industry professionals around the globe, um, which is the kind of unique thing about the, the network. So the IIBN in New York is, I guess it was one I know I mentioned initially before this, the, the Irish Consulate. The IIBN, the Irish Consulate are two of many Irish networks in the US. There's Digital Irish, um, there is the Irish Professional Network Group, various other other networks as well. And there, there's more and more being added by, by, the, by the year, I guess. So for me, networking and being out there and mingling is so important it it's it's great you like it's where you go and you find the jobs jobs are identified connections are made friendships are formed and especially when you're so far away from home just going to these Irish events you feel so at home and they bring in like you go there either for the networking there might be Christmas drinks summer drinks like kind of a party but you'd still be talking to somebody that you didn't know on the night and like that's kind of one thing that's one thing I said to myself anytime I go to an event I know especially for students even students listening to the podcast today sometimes you go to an event and I know I went to events when I was in college and you kind of stick with the people that you go to the event with and you're kind of mingling with them opposed to kind of just chatting to somebody that you didn't chat to before and that's kind of one thing I said to myself was Ashling, do not go to this event now if you're not going to meet somebody that you didn't know already. And sometimes it's hard because you're like, how do I break into this conversation? They're all chatting already. But even if it's when you're over filling up on the pot of tea or the orange juice in the morning or a cocktail at night, just chatting to somebody. And those events are just key to to just getting to know people and getting out there. And especially, I remember my first ever um Irish consulate event they all like a lot of them would have you'd have the same people kind of going kind of I guess Irish network hopping you'd go to all the different events um the IIBN being one that I I kind of stuck with but I'll I'll get to I'll get to that shortly but uh, the Irish consulate is kind of the first Friday breakfast every morning Mm. the first Friday of every month and they do great brown bread. They do great cocktail sausages. And I think that's Jesus. probably a reason <laughs> that a lot of people go there. Um, but it's great. And I remember when I first moved, they actually, they spoke with, as you kind of enter, they kind of spot the new J1 students because they're kind of younger looking and they kind of look like they don't really know what's going on or where they are. And it's really great. The speaker on the day would actually take the names of the J1 students in the room and at the end announce each person and wow. you tell them what area of work you're looking for and then you'd kind of raise your hand throughout the morning and people would come over and chat to you but I, I remember the first ever one I went to we we I went with one of my friends that I moved with and we rocked up and they had this announcement at the end where they called on all the J1 students and we kind of looked at each other and we were like oh they never took our names and in the back of my mind I'm like I can't be here I'm like one of these people too like I have to be known in the room and towards the end they kind of said you know does anybody else have anything to add and I actually kind of shimmied my way forward to the top of the crowd and I put my hand up in the air and she was like yeah do you want to come up to the podium and I was like okay yeah please if you don't mind so I went up, introduced myself, told them I'm fresh off the boat, um, what I was looking for. And I think I probably got five or six business cards that morning. Um, so it's things like that. Like, and it's, you just, 
you just don't you just want to get yourself out there um and that's a great great place to start within the Irish community and um, people are so helpful and I guess back sorry to the IIBN just one of those networks they have various events with various they'd have speakers like Samantha Barry who's obviously the editor-in-chief of Glamour magazine Ronan Dawn he's the CEO of Verizon in the US massive jobs and um, they'd be kind of guest speakers and you'd be you'd be given the opportunity to network with these people um so they're really great networks to be part of and I guess with the future leaders program that was um a board that I actually kind of got involved with back in 2018 and then there was an opportunity to become co-chair of the board. So myself and another another board member um, went for that position. And we have since launched a future leaders program. Hmm. Um, so maybe I can chat to you briefly about that. Please. Yeah. So the, the future leaders program in New York is something that we launched only at the beginning of March, ju- just gone this year. Um, it's a networking program or sorry, a mentorship program. And the mentorship program is something that we felt people needed. And it's funny because when I think about this and when I moved to New York, I didn't have a mentor. And I don't think in college we were kind of taught, OK, you need to go and get yourself a mentor. It's not really in us to kind of put ourselves out there and get a mentor. So I know there's probably students listening to this. And that's one thing that I would definitely encourage you to do is to just go and find a mentor, somebody that would just, somebody outside your circle that would guide you and just give you insight into either your, anything professional related, even personal related, just to have that kind of go-to person or people that help you out um, in various walks of life. And so for us, launching that program was so important. Um, so it's a it's a program where we get mentees and mentors on board and we link them up So each mentee is paired with a mentor and we host various events, obviously virtually now, whether it's kind of interview skills. We did a LinkedIn workshop recently um, and various things like that, which we think is so important, especially when you're at the point in your career. Maybe you don't know where you want to go next or maybe you're stuck in a rut. Having that mentor is so important. Um, And we figured the Future Leaders Programme was kind of it was a perfect opportunity to launch that in New York um so that's probably enough of me spieling on about the, the Irish networks in New York it's funny like it's some of my best friends in New York I've met them at networking events so it's it's they're really really powerful networking isn't just for your career so yeah exactly it's a nice social social element of it you'd be kind of looking for events to go to after work and it's like oh this Irish event is on I'll go to that I'd like to know more about your involvement in uh, hashtag I am remarkable. Absolutely. So I am remarkable is a Google initiative and it strives to empower women and underrepresented groups to speak openly about their accomplishments in the workplace. I took part in this program, as I mentioned previously, Siegel and Gale is part of the Omnicom group and they have this Omni Women network. And this course was introduced to the Omni Women um, employees, I guess, of the network. And I undertook this course and it was so powerful. I guess the goal of the the I Am Remarkable program is to improve motivation and self-promotional skills of women and underrepresented groups and to kind of change the social perceptions and refresh the conversation around self-promotion. Something that I know myself personally struggle with and I know a lot of people do and you mightn't even be a woman or in an underrepresented group. And you still might struggle with self-promotion. So it's so relevant to, to everyone. Um, so we took that course and then they actually offered um, a facilitator training program to become an actual host of the program. So I figured, you know what, it's so I was really, really passionate about it. I thought it was such a great workshop. So I went on to become a facilitator and actually hosted some workshops within our organization at Siegel and Gale. And we had people that weren't in any of those groups um, take part. And it was just... It was just so powerful um, just kind of changing people's perceptions towards it. And you know what? It's something I know when things now have gone virtually, there's been kind of a pause on these kind of, I guess, in-person virtual or in-person workshops. But um, it's something that I want to kind of continuously learn about and be involved in. And I think it's so important to kind of have these things going on in the side as well, especially if it's something that you're passionate about yourself and you kind of want to improve your own skill set. 
I completely agree. I, I think uh, there's a lot more learning to be done outside of the workplace. Are you ready for the rapid fire questions? I guess. If I'm not ready now, I'll never be ready. <laughs> Cork or New York? Cork. Good news or the bad news first? The good news. Would you rather make a phone call or send a text? A phone call. Would you rather work in a group or work on your own? Work in a group. Facebook or Instagram? Instagram. What's a failure that's helped you learn? Comparing myself to others. Would you rather work from home or from the office? From home. Best piece of career advice you've ever been given? Not being afraid to take a step back to move forward. Would you rather be a little late or way too early? Way too early. Barrys or Lions? Barrys. If you could have any other job for just a day, what would it be? I think I'd like to be a meteorologist. Ironic. A weather woman. <laughs> Are you yeah, getting the thunder yeah. as well, by any yeah. chance? Yeah, that's uh, quite the, yeah, quite the uh, coincidence. <laughs> what do you miss most about Ireland? The people and the welcoming nature of everyone. Favourite Irish slang to use in New York City? Or the one that gets the best response from Americans? Away with the fairies. Setting the scene. It's August 2021. You step on stage as the Cork Rose at the Rosa Tralee Festival. What's your special talent? You know what's funny? I actually entered the Cork Rose in 2015. And my talent, which was kind of a made-up talent was I actually rapped on stage. <laughs> but please don't ask me to repeat the rap. <laughs> so maybe I might find a new talent by then. <laughs> Ashling, thank you so much for coming on to today's episode. Uh, you've been an absolute blast to chat to. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, my pleasure and best of luck with the podcast. 